Hello, welcome to Microfiche Microphone. I'm Micah, and on this channel we look at microfiche from the past, old newspaper articles in the public domain. We look at them with our modern eyes, our modern perspective, and see what we can learn from them. On this microfiche time capsule, we are looking back at the juvenile instructor from the 15th of November, 1901. And this article is entitled, Lives of Our Leaders, the Twelve Apostles, Hiram M. Smith. So, in case you hadn't noticed, our series of the Lives of Our Leaders should be winding down because we went through all of the Twelve Apostles, all of the Presidency of the Seventy, and the entire Presiding Bishopric and Presiding Patriarch. So, you would think, oh, well, what else is there? Well, uh, around that time, 1900, 1901, there was a little, there were a couple changes, and one of them was that um, Hiram M. Smith was called into the Quorum of the Twelve. So they were trying to catch up a bit, a little bit, and decided to write an article on Hiram M. Smith. And uh, I actually know a lot about this person because this is one of the few people that I wrote articles on back in the day. There were 20 in total, in case you were wondering. Um, but yeah, this was one of them. And in my personal opinion, this person should be one that everyone in the church knows about and somehow no one does and he was just an absolutely remarkable person and absolutely like triggered a couple of events um, and so it's really interesting to to learn about him so if you don't know who this is you are in for a treat and I will fact check a little bit on my own article because I trust my own research and uh, um, yeah, and I uh, feel very comfortable with what I have written. So, um, it's up on my website in case you want to know. Follow the link. Um, anyways, so let's get started. Lives of our leaders, the Twelve Apostles, Hiram M. Smith. Hiram Mack Smith was the first son of his parents, Joseph F. Smith and Edna Lamson Smith. This is the oldest son of Joseph F. Smith. He named him after his father, Hiram Smith, and his grandmother's maiden name, Lucy Mack. Yeah, and it's um, interesting that nobody knows who this person is. <laughs> People think of the son of, of Joseph F. Smith, they think of Joseph Fielding Smith. Well, that's true. That's one of his sons. But Hiram Mack Smith was his eldest son, and they were very close. Okay and was born on the 21st day of March, 1872, in Salt Lake City. He was very carefully guarded by his mother, who was loath to let him out of her sight, who never permitted him or his brothers that came after to go beyond the confines of the garden gate alone. Long after he reached the age of hundreds of boys and girls, too, that we now see playing in the streets until late at night, he was safely tucked into bed. I find it interesting that they emphasize that, like he was very, like, sheltered. Um, Sure. I mean, it does mean that he wasn't neglected, I guess. It does speak well of his, uh, the parenting of his parents, yeah. His mother, a woman of strong character and great faith, often gathered her children and many of the children of their neighbors round the hearthstone and spent hours relating to her never-tiring listeners the stories of the Bible, Book of Mormon, and the history of the restoration of the gospel and early rise of the church. The lives of Joseph, Moses, Samuel, David, our Savior and his apostles were vividly contrasted with those of Pharaoh, Saul, Judas, Herod, and Nero. The great faith and obedience of Nephi, Jacob, Alma, Mormon, and Moroni were clearly portrayed to be vastly better and more acceptable to the Lord than the doubt, wickedness, and murderous apostasy of Laman, Lemuel, Sherem, Korahor, and Gadianton. The visions of Joseph Smith, his trials and persecutions, the rise of the church, the patient toilings of the saints in building a city and temple to the Lord, only to be driven by a murderous mob of wicked men beyond the boundaries of civilization, there to build another city and temple, the final cruel murder of the prophet Joseph and his brother, the grandfather of you children. Why is that in quotes? <laughs> the destruction of and expulsion from their beautiful city of Nauvoo, the long, weary march across the desolate plains and the halt upon the most desolate, forbidding spot of all, where their prophet leader, striking his cane into the parched soil, exclaimed, It is enough, this is the right place, were all most vividly described and indelibly imprinted upon the minds of the little ones. 
that is quite a long description <laughs> for saying that he was taught the Bible stories <laughs> and the stories of the church history, which makes sense because, you know, his father lived them. All these things Hiram eagerly drank in and pondered upon. His father, President Joseph F. Smith, would also gather round him his boys and teach them to shun evil, to be honest and truthful, associate with no bad companions, and with picture and narrative show them the results of doing right and wrong. Thus were Hiram and other children made their companions of their parents, friends unto whom they could go at all times, and pour out the inmost secrets of their hearts in full confidence. He grew up, developing, into, developing to a marked degree the boundless love and impartial affection which he had been accustomed to see his father and mother meet out to their children, and his father to his wives. Until he left the paternal roof of his parents, he would be visited by that ever-loving father who must still kiss him and tuck the cover snugly around him. Even today, whenever father and son meet in the home, on the street, in the office, it matters not where, they meet with an affectionate and holy kiss. I have heard his wife banter him and say, Hiram is the biggest baby I ever saw. I believe he would die if he could not go home and see his mother every day. He was taught to love his home, and there he could always be found when no duty called him away. See, and I think that's kind of sweet, you know? He's clearly close to his parents. Um, yeah, I mean, affectionate. And I think that's that's really... Like, it sounds like a healthy relationship, you know? He attended the public schools and later the Latter-day Saints College, from which he graduated in June 1894. On the 15th of November 1895, he was married to Miss Ida Bowman of Ogden, and on the evening of the next day, he departed on a mission to Great Britain. Upon arriving at Liverpool, he was appointed to labor in the Leeds Conference, where he engaged in regular missionary work. In October 1896, he was called to preside over the Newcastle Conference, which position he held until he was honorably released to return home in February 1898. Upon arriving home, he was at once set apart as a home missionary. He also acted as assistant teacher and as corresponding secretary of the 24th Quorum of the Seventy. He was employed at ZCMI, where he remained until October 30, 1901, when he was called to the Quorum of the Twelve. Yeah. When the Salt Lake Stake was divided, he became a resident of Granite Stake. Here also he labored as a home missionary and labor, and later was called to act as stake secretary of the Sunday schools, which office he filled to the satisfaction of the stake authorities. He was called by the Quorum of the Apostles to become one of that, of that body on October 24, 1901, and was ordained by his father on the same day. He is a young man who has striven to, to profit by the excellent teachings he has received from his parents. He gives his parents and the Lord the credit for enabling him to say that up to the present he has never tasted tea, coffee, tobacco, or intoxicating drinks of any kind, that he has never taken the name of the Lord in vain, nor befouled his mouth with profanity, that he has never in his life spoken disrespectfully of his parents, but that he honors and loves them with all his soul, that he has always defended the principles of the gospel and the servants of the Lord that he has a testimony for himself that God lives, and that Joseph Smith was the prophet through whom he restored the gospel of Jesus Christ in these latter days, and that he hopes, by the help of the Lord, to ever be found working diligently or battling, if need be, in defense of the truth. MFC was Math uh, Matthias F. Cowley, um, who I've also done an article on. Anyways, in case you're interested. Um... So that doesn't go into very much detail, and the reason is because he was still very young. I mean, you would be surprised, I think. He was born in 1971, he was just around 30, and he had just been called to the Quorum of the Twelve. Um, so I'm going to go to my own website <laughs> and um, look up this article, because it, it, he led a, an interesting life, and in fact, it was his death that triggered a whole bunch of other things. So, his death actually being very significant um, moment in church history. And I think that most people don't realize how significant it really was. So, my article on Hiram M. Smith, I chose a scripture to represent him, and I chose my son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother, Proverbs 6.20. 
which I think is very fitting considering how very close he was to his parents. So he was ordained on the 24th of October 1901 at age 29 by Joseph F. Smith. So, um, yeah, not quite 30. He was almost 30. I'm going to skip the first part because most of this is, um, like already covered, <laughs> you know, and what we just read, but not very much. I'm not going to skip too much of it because a lot of it has, um, what happened after, you know, because he's being pretty young at the time that he didn't have a very eventful life up to that point. He had lived at home, he'd gone to college, he got married, you know, he started working as ECMI and then he was called as an apostle. You know, like he hadn't really done much up until that point. Anyways, so I am going to start with his early service as an apostle. Okay, on 24 October 1901, Hiram M. Smith was ordained an apostle by his father, President Joseph F. Smith. He also served on the Young Men's Mutual Improvement Association General Board immediately upon entering the apostleship. At the time of his calling, he said, Today I have witnessed the most imposing and impressive ceremony I ever saw, namely the way in which we have done our voting. It seems to have been a confirmation of my testimony. I could not describe the feelings I had while witnessing the voting. Brethren and sisters, I feel for the first time since I have been called to this position to be firmly and soundly on my feet again. Nobody knows, save those who are called to undergo the same experience, just how I felt and I do feel. Early in his service as an apostle, he traveled a great deal, visiting the stakes of Zion, assisting older members of the quorum to organize and reorganize stakes, dedicate meeting houses, attend mutual improvement conventions, etc. He explained, My labors have been among the Latter-day Saints, and during the last six months I have visited quite a number of the stakes of Zion, being in attendance at a state conference upon each Sabbath day. Consequently, I have visited in that time nearly half of the stakes of Zion, which I think is quite impressive, don't you? I have to be quite active to do something like that. In February 1904, Elder Smith went to Washington, D.C. to testify in the Reed Smoot investigations. Then, in 1905, he traveled to Vermont with his father to participate in the dedication of a monument to Joseph Smith. He was talented in business affairs and became director of ZCMI and the Utah State National Bank. He also served as chairman of the board to control of control of the Deseret Gymnasium. Elder Smith was called to succeed Elder Rudger Clausen as president of the European Mission. This is really his only main time he was away from home. This was really kind of difficult to do, yeah? On 18 September 1913, President Smith was in Germany on a mission tour at the outbreak of World War I. Like, does that sound fun to you? It doesn't to me in July of 1914, and had difficulty getting passage back to the mission office in England. He was very successful in modifying the missions according to wartime situation. Many missionaries had to be sent home, but the missions didn't close completely. Hard work, caution, and the hand of the Lord allowed missionary work to continue. President Smith tried to alter the missions as little as possible. He helped to instill in the hearts of the missionaries serving at that time the love of mankind in general, and a burning desire to preach the gospel to a war-torn world. See, don't you think that was wonderful? This time of trial, however, also gave opportunity to demonstrate his strong love of his wife and family. In 1914, a group of Relief Society sisters decided to take a trip to Rome, and Sister Ida Smith, El Elder Smith's wife, decided to accompany them from Liverpool to Rome. Before leaving, she expressed her concern about their children in her absence, and Elder Smith said, Be at peace, for they shall never leave my sight while you are away. I love that, <laughs> you know. And I feel like that's kind of the um, the example that his parents set to him, yeah? Is that, you know, keep your eyes on your kids at all times. It was a promise he kept. Also, the two of them wrote letters back and forth literally every day of their separation. Sister Smith had a birthday while in Rome, and on the day of her birthday, a beautiful basket of flowers was delivered to her room, ordered from her husband by telegraph. Isn't that sweet? It's so romantic. Like, I think he's such a little, like, uh, romantic at heart. It's so sweet. While serving as president of the European Mission, Elder Smith also wrote a commentary on the Doctrine of Covenants to, together with Jana M. Siodal. Their work was published for the first time posthumously in 1919 in Liverpool and is still considered the definitive work on the Doctrine and Covenants. So I think that it shows really his understanding of the church history, even though he wasn't there himself. His wife worked alongside him in the mission, and both were beloved of the missionaries serving in all the European missions. They returned home 15 September 1916. 
Elder Richard West, serving in the Netherlands mission under President Legrand Richards at the time, said of him, Elder Hiram M. Smith was a man of such pleasing address and humble manners as to peculiarly fit him for the special calling of witness of the Lord. Upon his return, he seemed to pick up where he left off with renewed en energy and enthusiasm. Elder Hiram M. Smith died suddenly on the 23rd of January, 1918, of a ruptured appendix at age 45. Um, so this is really something that triggered another chain of events. So even though you would think, okay, his life is over, so we're kind of done with this story, we're kind of not because his death had so much influence. So I'd like to keep going. Of his death, Elder Orson F. Whitney related, I am glad that I could be one of those who were with him almost in his last hours. I was with him and his brother, Joseph F. Jr., who is also known as Joseph Fielding Smith today, on Friday, five days before his death. We were associated in committee work, and as Hiram arose to depart, he complained of a slight pain in the abdomen. But in his genial way, he passed it off with a half-jocular remark and proceeded homework. homeward. That was the last I saw or heard of him until early Sunday morning, when, with Elder James E. Talmadge, I was summoned to his bedside. It was about one o'clock, and the message that came stated that Brother Hiram was seriously ill. We were the only members of the Council of the Twelve then available, and others being engaged as elsewhere. We hastened to his home and found him suffering very intensely. We administered to him repeatedly the healing ordinances of the church, and he became easier and finally slept. We remained with him until morning. As soon as practicable, he was taken to the hospital to undergo an operation, and after I had a little rest, I went to the hospital for the purpose of blessing him again. But he had just been taken into the operating room and was even then under the influence of the anesthetic. I returned in the evening and gave him my blessing, administering in conjunction with Elder Joseph F. Smith, Jr. After Sunday night, it was not deemed wise to admit anyone to the sick room. Consequently, that was the last I saw of Hiram until I looked upon his lifeless form this morning. Remember back then that they didn't have antibiotics. So, yeah, you could get your appendix removed, but it was literally a last resort. Like, they tried to just hope that you would get over it, basically, that your body would fight off the infection. But obviously, that wasn't common. So, it's really devastating if you have a ruptured appendix like he did. His father, Joseph, President Joseph F. Smith, was particularly devastated by his death. He said... My soul is rent asunder, my heart is broken, and flutters for life. Oh, my sweet son, my joy, my hope. He was indeed a prince among men. Never in his life did he displease me or give me cause to doubt him. I loved him through and through. He has thrilled my soul by his power of speech as no other man ever did. Perhaps this was because he was my son and was filled with the fire of the Holy Ghost. And now what can I do? Oh, what can I do? My soul is rent. My heart is broken. Oh, God, help me. Like, that's so heartbreaking. He was the president of the church. So you would think that he would be so close to God that he would maybe not mourn as much because he had such great faith. But he did. And his heart was absolutely broken. He was shattered at his son's death. This was his oldest son, his favorite person in the world, basically. And he was devastated at his death. They were absolutely really close. So that was one thing that happened, was that his father was devastated at his death. And here's the next thing. Eight months later, and only one month before his own death, President Joseph F. Smith received a vision now known as Section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants, President Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead. He received that vision because he was thinking of his son, Hiram M. Smith. So few people know that in the church that it's ridiculous. So if you didn't know that, spread the word. I think everyone should know this. Hiram M. Smith, amazing person, and this sudden death devastated his father. Here's the next thing that ended up happening. Elder Smith's wife, Ida Bowman Smith, died that same year, 24 September 1918, 
nine months after the death of her husband of complications related to childbirth after having given birth to a son. In other words, she gave birth nine months after his death. There's no way she could have known she was pregnant when he died. Can you imagine? She literally got pregnant just before his death and gave birth. And then, and so instead of four children, he had five, which he didn't even know about. And then she died in childbirth. Like, it's mind-blowing to me. They left behind five children, two sons, and three daughters. Two of their children became well-known in their own right. His oldest son, Joseph Fielding Smith, not to be confused with Elder Smith's brother, Joseph Fielding Smith. I know it's confusing. Later, president of the church uh, served. Uh, so this, that was not his son. His brother became president of the church. His son, Joseph Fielding Smith, served as patriarch to the church for a time. And his daughter, Geraldine Smith, was the mother of modern apostle M. Russell Ballard. Yeah. Um, so this is all related. Yeah. Anyways. Um, also, I did a little bit of digging and it turns out that the children were taken care of by the mother's sister who had never married, I understood, but she was willing to take in all five children. Now, granted, the oldest, Joseph Fielding Smith, the one not to be confused with his brother, anyway, he um, was 19 at the time, so he didn't really need taken care of, but he would like to have kind of a home base while he, you know, moved on with his life slowly. Um, didn't have to be thrust out into the world and be like, good luck, child. Um, so, he also was very close to his aunt so not only the younger kids or especially the baby who was completely raised by the aunt but joseph fielding smith also testified about how close he was to this aunt and how she became more of a mother figure for him so um yeah even even though he was an adult when she took custody of the other four children he became very close to her as well anyways um, so that's not in the article, but uh, I want to read quickly my conclusions of about um, Hiram M. Smith. So what kind of a man was Hiram M. Smith? He was a bold and fearless man. He deeply believed the gospel and strived every day of his life to live it. He believed in keeping the commandments and preached them. He loved his family and they returned his devotion. He was a hard worker and was ever engaged in a good cause. Financially, he was never very successful, but he offered his family something more valuable, a virtuous life. He was always teaching the principles of truth. He did all he could to remain close to the Spirit and to serve those around him. Um, so I think his relationship to his family is probably the strongest legacy that he left behind. And uh, I will include all of my sources from this article that I wrote. Um, in the description below so that you can go through them if you would like to but I spent quite a bit of time going through sources and trying to put things together to make it coherent and uh, um, anyway so I hope that you enjoyed that today this is one of my absolute favorite people and um, I'm sure some people will be happy that I didn't use Wikipedia to um, you know check fact check myself but uh, in this case I don't need it. By the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with using Wikipedia to fact check yourself. You're just looking at a second source. You know, I'm using a first source as this older article and I want to see how it matches up with what's on Wikipedia. Do I think that Wikipedia is the best source in the world? No, because I didn't use it when I write my articles like this one. But I'm, that's not what I'm doing right now. What I'm doing right now is I'm reading them to you so that you can get an idea of what's out there not so that I present all everything factual I want to help people to see how to do their own research and how to draw their own conclusions and see what they think and I'm trying to present these sources from the past in a more pure and innocent way so that you can see like what you think based on this source. I'm not saying that every source I'm reading is perfect. I'm saying believe what you want to believe and this is what I found. 
Now, if you found someone something else, absolutely let me know. But I'm not going to stop using Wikipedia as a source because all I'm doing is double checking some of the facts. And I think that looking at a second source is always helpful. Wikipedia being a good go-to place to start. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So I am not writing a research paper. If I were, then I would use more original sources. But because I am making a YouTube video and not writing a research paper that has to be vetted by my peers, I will be using Wikipedia. If you have a problem with that, maybe this isn't the channel for you. Or you can do your own research and make your own videos. There you go. Anyways, um, but I hope you enjoyed the video today because this is something I have researched in quite in depth. And um, I hope that you have gained a better appreciation and understanding of who Hiram M. Smith was as a person and um, how important he was in the history of the church, particularly in Joseph F. Smith's history himself. Anyways, um, if you did like the video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel and I hope to see you in the next video.